So, uh, so Dr. Horizon, he's the founder and uh, chief technology officer now, Focus Applied Technologies in Malaysia. So we have been collaborating with him in UNEP, also on the regional alignment and with other EV associations in, in, the, in, in ASEAN, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and he's worked uh, with a UN uh, framework on climate change on various vehicular emission projects uh, between two, 2011 to 2017. So uh, we'll hear about, about bit more about the process of how guidelines and standards came about in Malaysia. Uh, and I believe that would be an interesting uh, insight then for us uh, as we navigate uh, uh, the new regulations that are being set up in the Philippines and different cities uh, in the Philippines. So with that, uh, Dr. Horizon, you may now have the floor. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm glad to be here once again. Uh, I think an awful lot of uh, what I'm going to cover has really only been talked because many of our local um, regulations have been into the ASEAN regulation. Uh, but I will go over sort of our regulations together. Uh, so let's roll uh, time for question and answer. And so I'm going to blow through some of these slides fairly quickly. Uh, so if uh, if I miss skipping over anything that you want more detail on, please stop me. Uh, feel free to ask a question. Um, so uh, yeah, I run a technology company. We're a spinoff from one of the universities. We're uh, heavily involved in uh, transportation, transportation studies, and oh. instrumentation and whatnot. Um, and since working at the university, we've also been involved in the development of uh, standards, electric vehicle standards. Um, and uh, this goes back quite a long time. So uh, more than more than 10 years, uh, we've been developing standards. And as you'll see, we categorize them based on vehicle speed, because generally uh, we see as a lot of the um, a lot of the aspects of the vehicle uh, are based on the vehicle speed, like what roads you're allowed to use and do you need uh, safety equipment or not. Uh, hello. Um, of course, uh, as was mentioned, it was simply sort of a history of the development of the standards of later classes of standards. Uh, a lot of these have been fed into, so as was mentioned uh, uh, by uh, Bert, just concept use of, of in the development of the standard, you really do need to confirm uh, to give us a lot of the data, qualify as a given type of vehicle, and are they passing standards or not. However, we we go and test them. So if they claim, make a claim as to range or number of discharge cells, uh, you know, we, we, we trust them on, but we also go and verify. Um, and that's, that's really important because, you know, why do we even bother making standards? And predominantly, it's for safety. You know, we need to make sure, uh, as was mentioned previously, that uh, we don't have dangerous products out on the road. We want to make sure that when someone buys uh, a product, that it's, you know, a reasonably safe product. There are some minimum levels of quality, and we're not trying to push super high quality standards via the uh, uh, the standard. We're trying to basically say we want to eliminate the very low quality products where the customers are products from uh, inexpensive to luxury. And I will uh, dispense with a lot of the introductory stuff because we've gone over that briefly, but we've got quite uh, a history of developing standards here for electric vehicles in Malaysia. Um, we use them fairly extensively, but mostly there are two wheelers, uh, not a lot of three wheelers. Um, uh, also, as was mentioned, some of the Malaysian standards have been adopted and adapted into some of the ASEAN standards. Uh, and a lot of our sort of, I like to call it light duty electric vehicle standards have been applied to four wheelers as well. These are the mini car or, or you know, small car type uh, vehicles that we're talking about. So. There's a lot of different uh, pressures when you're trying to develop standards and legislation relating to these vehicles. And as everyone's mentioned, there's a lot of promise for these vehicles. They're very efficient. Um, they can enhance the uh, mobility of a lot of people, especially in the B40, because they're so uh, affordable. Um, 
but we need to make sure that they are uh, safe for the road. Um, we want to ensure a reasonable minimum level of quality and compatibility with existing infrastructure. So uh, how do we go about developing the standards? Well, the way we do it in Malaysia is we have a standards committee. It's fairly broad based committee. We have uh, representatives from various government departments, including the highway and the police, transportation, uh, standards. We have a, a, um, a ministry of standards, basically. Uh, road safety. We also include people like uh, environment. We have industrial partners, and these are partners. Um, sometimes they're uh, vehicle associations, like, for example, there's the Electric Vehicle Manufacturers Association in Malaysia and also within ASEAN. So we always have their representatives. We have uh, representatives from the automobile and motorcycle manufacturers. Uh, we also include a few academics, but not too many because those guys like to talk a lot. Um, so when we when we develop standards, there's a few uh, basic rules that we try to follow. Um, safety of the consumer and the other road users is always the first priority. Protection of the consumers from poor quality is a secondary priority. Um, also, we we try to to do or uh, or or legislate or mandate only what's necessary. But we also try to make sure that we mandate all of what's necessary. We don't want to leave out something that's very, very important. Um, also, uh, in number five down there, you can see if you can't measure it, don't spec it. A lot of countries um, adopt uh, specifications or standards from overseas, which is which is pretty reasonable. But uh, why are you specifying a given standard if you don't have the ability to measure it? It's you're basically wasting time. So. Um, in general, we do try to follow European practices or, or other existing appropriate international practices, uh, but we adapt, add, or change those as required for the local situation. So we, uh, we update these on a regular basis. Um, the, the reasons we update them is to try to keep pace with technology, but also to simplify them or add clarification in case something isn't clear uh, in a previous revision. Um, now, for other countries, when other countries are, are developing standards, and, and even within Malaysia, you really do need to consider some of the constraints uh, on the, the government or the body creating these. Manpower, you know, do you have the manpower to perform, you know, the, the testing that you're going to uh, try to implement? You've got to have sufficient manpower and also other resources, financial resources and uh, sort of like the technical capabilities. Uh, budget, right? You've, you've got to have a budget. Uh, you know, if we've got a standard on emissions and we're going to test it, well, someone has to come up with the budget for the test centers and the equipment and the calibration and training, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, knowledge. Um, one of the things we see uh, not so much in transportation, but in some of the other uh, standards within Malaysia is the federal government has very reasonable standards, but the local government units that will do the enforcement, oftentimes they don't have the expertise, they don't have the tools required to do the enforcement. So uh, that's, uh, that's uh, an important consideration. And of course, uh, space, uh, when you start talking about testing uh, vehicles, for example, you, you know, you're talking about millions of vehicles, potentially, you have to have the uh, space required to perform the testing. So, um, you know, uh, I guess reiterating a little is don't specify what you can't measure, um, only specify things that are required in, in order to ensure the goals, uh, safety, quality, and compatibility. Generally, we, we like to remain technology blind. We don't want to say, you know, lead acid battery or lithium ion battery. What we want to say is the battery weight or size or performance has to be within these parameters. So we like to specify performance of the product rather than the technology because if you if you mandate a given technology if you've, you've locked you've locked in uh you know the technological development is not allowed to develop beyond a certain level um now some of the other factors that are important 
you know, you know, what are the factors that are important to consumers? And one of the ways to discover that is to simply look at the advertisements. You know, you, here's an advertisement. This one happens to be from the Philippines. And uh, what do they talk about? Well, they talk about obviously the cost, uh, the power, the speed, the range, things like that. One of the things they frequently don't talk about when it comes to electric vehicles is the battery lifespan. There's a good reason they don't talk about battery lifespan, and usually it's because the battery lifespan is terrible. Um, uh, the, the low cost vehicles, especially, uh, one of the biggest customer complaints is the batteries don't last nearly as long as they are expected to. So this is, this is simply one way of getting at the quality factors that are important to customers is, is looking at the adverts. So um, also do a number of, uh, we, do, we do a fair amount of field work. So a lot of our standards are based on very common sense, straightforward measurements. When we're talking about uh, measuring performance of these vehicles, one of the first thing we do is we go survey the vehicles. We survey the vehicle owner and find out what are their capabilities, what are the limitations, what are the issues. And so uh, what's presented here, uh, uh, brief results for survey performed with the mirror two years ago, I believe, um, looking at electric vehicle owners in Malaysia. So the way, the way we did it is we simply went around a number of different geographic locations. I'm afraid of photographs somehow uh, got squeezed but we did it in different parts of the country uh, a mixture of rural and urban areas and we surveyed the owners and we used the vehicle uh, registration insurance safety habits um, you know everything that's listed down there so we were interested in some of the vehicle specifications where do they get it how much did it cost what's the top speed what's the range etc cetera, etc cetera. We also wanted to focus on accidents because when you're developing legislation, you can arbitrarily generate legislation, but it's not the best way to do it. The best way is to do it in response to data. And to collect data and see are there, are there safety issues associated with these vehicles? And if there are safety issues, then we need to generate standards or legislation to deal with it. So uh, a result of some of these surveys, of course, um, what we saw is there was an awful lot of electric two wheelers. When we did some of these surveys in the Philippines, we found that the number of two and three wheelers were just about matched. Um, and it, uh, there were very few electric four wheelers that we found in, in this survey. We didn't, we didn't have a single electric four wheeler. Um, although a lot, of, a lot of governmental organizations, when you say electric vehicles, they tend to think of cars. What we see in Southeast Asia is the electric vehicles in general are two and three wheelers. Um, it's a small segment of the market, but it's growing very rapidly. Uh, we think today it's on the order of 2% of the two wheelers in Malaysia are electric. So it's, it's a pretty significant number. Also, we noticed that the largest class by far is the 25 to 50 kilometer per hour class. And you can see in the lower left is a typical example. And there's some kids, obviously they don't have a license. They're not wearing helmets, but yet that vehicle that they're on can certainly go 35, 40 kilometers per hour. So we see that and we highlight, okay, this is, this is a significant problem. The photograph on the right shows a, a parking lot and it turns out two of the motorcycles there are electrics and only one is a combustion vehicle. We surveyed a bunch of brands and what we saw is uh, at the low end, of course, they're all 100% Chinese. There are several Malaysian manufacturers, but they generally do higher end products. They're the motorcycle class vehicles and 50 kilometer per hour and above. And they're not quite as popular because they're rather expensive. Um, trip purposes, predominantly the vehicles were being used to go for shopping and go back and forth to work with a minority being going back, back and forth to school. Usually it's, um, it's uh, mothers or parents sending the children back and forth to school. Uh, we had a, a study, we were looking at also the nationality of the writers. We found a fair number of foreign writers. One of the reasons there were so many foreign writers is they were typically foreign workers and they didn't have a license and they were under the impression that if they were riding an electric scooter, they didn't actually need a license, which is not uh, strictly correct, but that was the impression. 
Um, uh, also, about half of the owners, a little bit less than half of the owners, have no license, and so that's a you know it's it's an important piece of information to understand how many people you know, de facto, uh, how many people currently do have a license and none of these uh, drivers were insured, but it, we're, we're generally talking about the 25 to 50 kilometer per hour class vehicles, which may or may not require insurance depending on the local authorities. Uh, gender, we looked into, um, there's a fairly even split between men and women. We looked at uh, income classes and what we noticed is that the light duty electric vehicles are predominantly owned and operated by people kind of at the low end of the financial spectrum, not at the very bottom, but uh, certainly nowhere near the top. And we found a surprising number of these being used in the countryside. So if you had to compare the city versus the country, uh, they were very, very popular in the countryside for people going back and forth to their uh, orchards or rubber tree plantations. Whatnot. They're also used within the town, uh, but in terms of the density of vehicles, uh, we were really surprised how many were used in the countryside. Uh, there are some challenges for using these vehicles in urban settings, specifically charging. Uh, you know, in a, in a rural setting, when you park your vehicle at your house, you charge at your house. In an urban setting, if you're living in a high density building or a flat of some sort, very often there is no charging available down where your vehicles are parked, and oftentimes they're parked in the rain, which can make charging dangerous. So that's uh, certainly one of the issues. Um, in terms of demographics, we were also very surprised. The users of these vehicles we had aged from 12 years old to 70 years old, so a very wide range of ages. Um, uh, the average ownership had been something on the order of four years, and these vehicles were used quite heavily, like six days a week, but generally at very, very low mileages, on the average of about 33 kilometers per week. Typically, what we see a combustion two-wheeler in Malaysia is used on the order of 33 kilometers per day. So these vehicles are not a direct replacement for combustion vehicles. They're kind of a different class of vehicles. They're used for shorter trips. And uh, although they're used fairly frequently, they're used for uh, sort of short, low-speed trips. For a lot of these people, the electric vehicle was their main mode of transport. 95% of them said they basically only had this uh, electric scooter for transport. And um, most of them said that first reason is broken, they certainly go get another uh, because it's so convenient. The average cost of the vehicles were extremely low. Um, it ranged from 400 ringgits, which is about 100 USD, up to uh, 2,000 ringgits, which is about 500 USD. Um, the, 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 the inexpensive one was a secondhand vehicle. Uh, battery lifetimes on average, they last about two to four years. And the cost of replacing the batteries is on the order of about 100 USD. Some of the vehicle owners have changed their batteries as many as three times. And so this was a complaint for them. You know, when you buy a combustion vehicle, you know, uh, 10 years from now, it'll get the same range for the same number of, of liters of petrol. Uh, electric vehicles can't make that same uh, uh, statement. Maximum speeds were only on the vehicles that we surveyed only up to about 60 kilometers per uh, hour. And they, uh, a lot of them charge about four times per week. They have fairly low ranges. So we looked into the accidents, but we didn't have a statistically significant number of accidents to really make any huge conclusions. Uh, in general, there are accidents where uh, most of them were single vehicle accidents. They simply dropped the vehicle, and there was a minority of them being bumped by a car. None of these were fatal. They were all fairly smart. There have been fatal accidents, but none involved in the survey that we, uh, we have measured. So the number one complaints from customers related to the battery life expectancy. The batteries just don't last as long as they'd expect and they're very expensive to replace. Uh, secondary complaints related to poor braking, expensive or non-standard tires, and then uh, wear and tear, just general wear and tear and overall quality on the vehicle. So these are, um, these are not necessarily going to force us to generate standards or legislation surrounding this sort of thing, 
On the other hand, when the battery life expectancy is the number one customer complaint in result, uh, we did go ahead and uh, generate standards uh, relating to this, saying that they need to maintain a certain minimum life expectancy on the battery. And if a manufacturer uh, wants to make a claim, then they have to meet or exceed that claim. And that that uh, the the this is some data from lead acid batteries, and it says that lead acid battery, if it's done in a, an appropriate sort of situation, it should last at least 300 charge discharge cycles, and that would give it a reasonable life expectancy. If it's being overcharged or over discharged, it won't last that long. So instead of mandating lithium batteries, which will typically last a very long time, we said, no, no, we're just going to have a minimum number of charge discharge cycles, uh, which is mandated. And we've done that basically across all vehicle classes. Now. Um, and this is just a graph showing the, the different vehicle types and this 25 to 50 kph uh, range vehicle, uh, speed vehicle is certainly the most popular. Um, we've got some statistics on driver age, and as I said, there was a wide spread. Uh, and then we've got uh, just to, here's a, here's a, a comparison of the vehicles. Essentially, I think uh, given the time, that's what I really wanted to cover is uh, how uh, how we how we put these standards together in Malaysia, and uh, maybe some of the conclusions we got out of it. It's just a just a few more conclusions here I'll go over. As was mentioned uh, by uh, India, as well as uh, Bert and even Alvin, one of the important things will be to tie in these light duty electric vehicles to the given uh, transportation system, public transportation system. We don't want it to compete with it. That's been a problem in, uh, in China as well. We want it to really kind of work together with the local system. One way to do that would be to have local transportation hubs, which are interlinked. And at the local transportation hubs, if you provide charging, okay, people are, you know, they want to park their vehicles where they can charge them. So you have them park at a transportation hub and guess what? They can jump onto your public transportation system and zip to the uh, other end of the city or something like that. So uh, essentially the conclusions we've got from doing, you know, over a decade of this work here is that the electric two-wheelers and, and small three-wheelers are very, very efficient. Um, they're generally less expensive to own per year, but they're more expensive per kilometer when compared to convention motorcycles. And that's because of the battery replacement. They're disproportionately preferred by the old, uh, the very young and the poor. And there's some socioeconomic reasons for this. They have a very successful niche um, and it tends to be the low power, low cost, low speed, relatively short distance uh, vehicles. They're not competing directly with internal combustion engine vehicles uh, because the cost of an electric vehicle, which can directly compete with a combustion vehicle is simply too expensive most because the batteries need to be so big and so expensive. Uh, battery life was a uh, number one customer concern or complaint about their uh, vehicle. Um, a lot of the inexpensive vehicles using very light components, some were even based on bicycles. And a lot of the bicycle based vehicles would fail our minimum mechanical standard requirements. They, they basically weren't designed to hold the weight of the batteries and the vehicles were uh, overstressed. So we saw that during a lot of testing. Uh, so we do need standards to address these, uh, these concerns. Uh, additionally, uh, unlicensed uninsured riders are certainly a problem. Um, we expect them to have an accident similar to conventional motorcycles. What we've seen in our studies is that indeed the accident rate with motorcycles and electric uh, two-wheelers are, are commensurate. Uh, it's not to say that we're happy that we want to decrease the amount of apartment here called the JPJ and police uh, into this whole network of uh, collecting data so we can, we can come up with appropriate legislation and, uh, uh, and then enforcing it once we do it. Okay, for me, I think that's about it. What I'd prefer rather than to uh, uh, talk at you anymore is see if we've got any uh, questions and uh, address those questions.
Okay, uh, thank you, Horizon. Uh, so that is actually often the sentiment of the general population now, when they are coming out with, uh, I would say, new regulations, new policies in many cities, and it's not just in the Philippines, uh, there's always a, a call to understand or get the baseline information or at least the, the user profile uh, of potential and current users. Uh, as you said, could be as young as 12 years old, uh, up to 70 years old. And there, therefore, that kind of brings us back to the discussion on how do we make sure that we are ensuring their seamless travel, but ensuring that we have the right infrastructure for them. Uh, if there you know, are there uh, lanes for that, uh, could we dedicate a, a portion of the infrastructure for them and ensuring that you know, if you're a 12 or a 70 year old, uh, it, that would somehow be um, uh, not a deterrent for you to to try and use the electric two and three wheelers. And a general uh, idea like, uh, are the regulations uh, that are being developed in Malaysia generally acceptable uh, by the citizens? Yeah, um, we have not had any pushback from the public at all. Uh, of course, the government, when they develop a regulation before it becomes law, they have a fairly extensive period of public debate. So when we come up with uh, new standards, uh, we have um, sort of like uh, public uh, interactive public sessions where we invite in uh, lots and lots of people, uh, especially folks from industries. And we describe the uh, the new standards, the proposed standards, and we ask them to comment. So there's a mandatory period of public. And if there's any serious concerns raised by pretty much anybody, then we go and we have to address those before we can turn into law. What we see in general of pushback, uh, people, they want to understand what it is mostly we get feedback sell a product um, how can we comply with driving the cost of the product up and of course the one of the biggest concerns the manufacturers have is say well if we're going to comply with it we want to make sure that everybody complies with it we don't want to see product which is non-compliant and cheap coming in because we can't compete with it you know we're by definition a higher level or a higher standard so that's the only thing that we've seen. Um, you know, there there may be issues where uh, if you've got people driving around not helmets and you in them, they may be unhappy with that. On the other hand, uh, I'm sure their family. Um, I'm not hearing the audio. Um, I don't know. Can I confirm that this is not from not a technical issue from my uh, end? Yes. Uh, negative feedback from the public for these things. Um, I, I lost it for a bit, Horizon. Uh, I believe uh, not only from my end. Okay, here the the video is soft. We may have had a bad um, uh, okay. we may have had a bandwidth problem again. Mm -hmm. Sorry, could you repeat the last? Uh... Okay, so so the last little bit was you were, you're were asking about uh, the, the the pushback we get during uh, you know from the public or something like that. And we yes, don't. we uh, we we find that we we get good acceptance from them. You know, some manufacturers concerned about some things, but. Uh, in general, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's fairly acceptable to the public. Part of the reason is we also operate under um, sort of a usage of, of, of de facto usage. How is the product currently being used? And we look into that. We don't want to blindly mandate you can or cannot do something. We look at how the vehicles are being used and is it a problem? And the fact is, if it's being used in a certain way, which maybe we would say shouldn't be done, if it's not causing a problem, then it's not a problem and we don't need to uh, you know, mandate that it can't be done. So what we try to do is, is what we call sort of data-driven legislation where we collect data 
And then when we've got the data and we say, absolutely, you know, if you do, if you do such and such, if you drive these overloaded, it's dangerous, we know it, here's the data. And then even if somebody did complain, it's like, well, we have the data, you know, if you have data to support your side, or you have data that refutes what we're saying, then we'll listen to you. But if you don't, then you're just an opinion and we have data and uh, data trumps an opinion every time. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think we could also try and see how the Philippine one was, uh, how it's faring as compared to the ASEAN guidelines. We, we saw a, a lot of good suggestions on how we could also um, enhance the ones that we have already on the ground and see the opportunities. Unfortunately, the, the land transportation office uh, are, is not able to join us. We had a, a chat just right before we started this session. So uh, we can then elevate the outcomes and the discussions from this session uh, to uh, our other partners. Um, so uh, th thank you so much, uh, Dr. Horizon.